Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us for the first edition of our summer series of Clean Water Topics on Tap. I'm Emily Molden, the Executive Director of the Nantucket Tech Land Council. We are an environmental nonprofit organization with a mission to help protect and preserve Nantucket's water resources. We spend a lot of time researching the health of our ponds and of our harbors and educating the community on how to help improve their condition. In addition to things like fertilizer runoff and inputs, wastewater is one of the primary sources of nutrient pollution that's actually under our best control. So we're here today to talk about one of our favorite topics, septic systems. Anyone who's resident or business is not tied directly into the town's municipal sewer system, uses some type of septic system. State and local regulations are in place that will dictate what type of system you have and how it's constructed. But regardless of what kind of system you have, there are some very specific things that you should know about operating these systems properly that will help you to minimize the nutrient pollution that they contribute to the surrounding areas. So we have two very special guests to speak with us tonight about septic, which is definitely a very important topic in the realm of water quality on and around Nantucket. But before I introduce them to get a few nuts and bolts out of the way, we will have a question and answer period at the end. There'll be plenty of time for that. And if you do have a question, you'll see a Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And you can just click on there and enter your question. You can even enter it during the presentation and then we'll be able to uh, have our speakers address the question at the end. So to start us off uh, today, we have Dr. Alyssa Cox, who I'm very excited to have with us. She is the program director of the New England On-Site Wastewater Treatment Program out of the University of Rhode Island. Alyssa received a Bachelor of Science and Master's of Science degree in Environmental Science, and her research really focuses on, on groundwater table dynamics and how changes to the water table can be affecting the current and future systems, systems in specifically in nearshore and coastal areas. So pretty relevant to us here on Nantucket. Effective outreach and education are very important to her. They remain priority interests, as well as looking more closely at the resiliency of coastal communities facing future challenges and threats and how uh, things like climate change and sea level rise impact our septic systems. After we hear from Alyssa, I'll introduce you to Stephen Visco, who many of you may know from right here on Nantucket as a member of our Board of Health and uh, Visco Pumping. But first, we'll start out with Alyssa. So welcome, Alyssa. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Emily. I'm really excited to spend a little bit of time talking to folks on Nantucket about something that is near and dear to me. Um, so we'll be talking today a little bit about septic systems and hopefully by the end, you'll have a better understanding of how septic systems are a major component to protecting public and environmental health, especially on Nantucket. Um, so just to kind of orient us, first we'll talk kind of some very basic septic system 101, I call it. What is the purpose of a system? How does it work? We'll get into advanced wastewater treatment systems, um, which help treat wastewater to a higher level so that it is less juicy, has fewer contaminants by the, way, by the time it makes its way out into the environment. And we'll have a little pep talk on what you can do to help preserve Nantucket waters. And I'll just wrap up with that. And then it'll be time for to hear from Stephen Visco. So uh, as I'm sure everybody knows, human waste is a source of diseases. And we know that uh, we started to learn that in the mid 1800s in London when they had cholera outbreaks and they realized that if you mix human waste with drinking water, people get very sick. So uh, at some point they realized ways to interrupt this fecal oral disease transmission is to have protective barriers that keep the poop out of your drinking water, off your hands, 
off your crops so that they don't make their all those bacteria and disease causing organisms don't make their way back into your digestive system and make you ill. So septic systems are a form of sanitation barrier that keep human waste out of our drinking water resources and also out of our land or off our land surface and therefore don't contaminate our food crops. So um, as Emily alluded to, some places uh, have centralized uh, wastewater treatment infrastructure where all of the wastewater from different properties gets piped to a centralized system where it's treated. But in some places that's not feasible either because there's no place to put in a big centralized wastewater treatment system or it's just not cost effective because properties are scattered so far apart that it doesn't make sense to connect them all with pipes. And so that's when we rely on on-site wastewater treatment systems or septic systems. And here's a sort of schematic of what a conventional typical septic system contains. Typically all the wastewater leaves the house and enters the septic tank, um, which has a specific job we'll get into in a minute. Uh, some of the, and then the septic tank is separating the solid bits from the liquid and the liquid then makes its way into the distribution box and then to the drain field. The drain field has lots of names, sometimes it's called the leach field or the soil absorption area or soil absorption system, soil treatment area. There's about as many names as there are regions for this. Um, but the idea is here that our wastewater enters the soil and is treated then before it rejoins groundwater. So first we'll talk a little bit about what septic tanks do and why they're important uh, and need some TLC from time to time. And then we'll talk about how the drain field or the soil is treating our wastewater. So here is a cross section of a septic tank. Up here you'd have the ground surface and then you have two what are called access risers or manholes sometimes. These can be made out of concrete and have concrete lids or they can be this funny dark green color on the more modern systems. And the idea is that all the wastewater enters the septic tank from the building. And the septic tank is supposed to be sort of a quiescent quiet area where there is time for the water to slow down and move and anything heavier than water sinks to the bottom, uh, forming the sludge layer and anything lighter than water, any sort of cooking oils or grease or conditioner or body lotion rises to the top to make the scum layer. And the job of the septic tank is really to keep these solids in the tank and allow the liquid to become clear and clear as it settles so that you're sending liquid, clarified liquid out to the drain field. You don't wanna be sending a lot of solids to the drain field because that's not good for the drain field. Another thing to keep in mind is that the septic tank, even though there is air space in the top of this, it is a, a non-oxygen environment. There is no oxygen present. Um, there's not a lot of diffusion of gases, but also there are a lot of contaminants inside this tank. So any oxygen that might make its way in is used up right away from any microbes that are living in this area. Um, and this will be relevant in a minute when we talk about the advanced systems. So what happens over time is that the septic tank is doing its job. It's collecting these solids. And that's why we need to pump our septic tanks periodically. And so what's happening over time, right? At first, the house, you know, the fresh tank, people start using water in the house, the water makes its way into the septic tank, the septic tank is separating the solids, um, that clarified liquid moves into the other compartment and then eventually out to the drain field. And over time, these solids layers accumulate and become thicker and thicker and thicker, which makes less room for the water to hang out in and the water starts moving faster and it it's harder for the solids to settle out because they, the water isn't hanging out in this tank as long because there's not as much room. And this is why it's really important to pump your septic tank um, on a routine basis. And the frequency of that sort of depends on how the system is being used as some properties add more solids, some fewer. And so this is where having a trusted service provider that can help you gauge your rate of solids accumulation and the, the frequency at which you need to be pumped is really important. So septic tanks need to be pumped. The point is to keep the solids in there so they don't destroy your drain field. So having your tank pumped is a really good piece of maintenance that you should be doing regularly. If we look at a cross section of what's happening in the drain field, right? So the wastewater goes out to the distribution box and then to the drain field. If we were to take a bread knife and cut down into the ground and look at sort of on end, what we saw is if we cut through a loaf of bread, this is what we would see. You'd have the ground surface up here somewhere, there'd be some grasses. And then if you have a, a pipe on stone type of drain field, you have these trenches that are filled with gravel or crushed stone. 
Um, and each of those trenches um, has a perforated PVC pipe in it. Sometimes this material is sand, it doesn't really matter. It's some sort of infrastructure that we add with some sort of perforated PVC pipe. And the idea is that the wastewater trickles out of that. And then eventually there is native soil. And so we, I talk about the infiltrative surface and that is sort of where our man-made wastewater treatment infrastructure ends and the native soil begins. And so you'll notice there's a seasonal high water table down here, right? Groundwater is below ground. And so in Rhode Island and other places, we talk about the separation distance. And when we refer to that, we're talking about how far is sort of the bottom of that wastewater infrastructure that we added as humans to the seasonal high groundwater table, right? Which kind of changes over the year, over the course of the year, it's higher in the springtime until the trees leaf out and start to use that water. And then becomes lower and lower in the summer until the rainy season happens again and we get more rain and fewer plants pulling that water. Another thing to note that especially in Nantucket and other coastal areas, coastal groundwater is connected to the ocean. And so groundwater tables, especially really close to the coast, will go up and down with the tide and they're interconnected. And groundwater makes its way out to coastal water bodies uh, below ground, not just in surface waters. So if we're looking at what's happening in the soil, if you were to look at the soil with a microscope, you would see that soil is made up of soil particles, and then it's made up of pore spaces or little pockets of air around those. Some of those little pores are very small and they're filled with water, and some of them are filled with air. Um, and this sort of soil structure is what we're relying to do on to do a bunch of wastewater treatment. And so one thing that this little pore, this series of sort of clumps and holes in the soil make is that it provides kind of like a sieve so any pathogens or disease causing organisms in the wastewater are kind of screened out and they're trapped in the soil where then they can be eaten by other microbes or they die because the soil is not the same thing as your digestive tract. And so therefore conditions are not super great for certain pathogens to survive. So that is one way that soil does a really good job of reducing the disease causing organisms in wastewater. Another thing the structure provides is habitat. And it provides microscopic habitat for all the microbes that live in the soil naturally. And these microbes do awesome things for us. As nutrients from the wastewater move through the soil, there are microbes there that are going to use those to do microby things and grow more little microbe cells and sisters and brothers. Um, and so they can help reduce some of the nutrient loading um, that's coming from our wastewater into the soil. And so the microbes are what are making some of the magic happen in terms of wastewater treatment. And so the idea is that the soil, the wise water trickles out of these pipes, it moves through these trenches or the sand system or whatever kind of drain field infrastructure has been designed. And by the time the wastewater has trickled through the soil, made it down to the groundwater, it's pretty clean so that we are not adding um, a lot of contamination to our groundwater. So that's the idea. Now, if we think about climate change, and this is sort of something I could wax poetic on for many, many, many many hours, uh, some days I do, um, but the short version from my research or what I looked at is understanding how climate change is impacting our coastal septic systems. So on the one hand, we know that climate change is resulting in more storm activity. Our storms are becoming more frequent, they're becoming more intense. We think that trend is accelerating, we see it accelerating, and that means we have to deal with flooding and erosion whenever there's a storm event, right? And I'm sure this is very on the forefront of people's minds in the decade. We also, as part of climate change, are seeing changes in our precipitation patterns. Sometimes we have more droughts. Other places are getting more precipitation than usual. Sometimes it's just a lot of one or not enough of the other, sort of in weird succession, right? 2020 was weirdly dry, but then we also get weird floods in places. And this has implications for groundwater, right? Because precipitation raises groundwater tables when it infiltrates. We also have to worry about sea level rise, right? And in Nantucket, your sea level is going up about uh, a six, 1.16 inches per year, which doesn't seem like that much sort of the scale of a decade, right? And so sea level rise makes everything worse, right? I told you that, you know, coastal groundwater tables are connected to sea level. So as sea level goes up, so do coastal groundwater tables. And that means sort of flooding both from the ocean during storms, but it also can mean flooding because the groundwater tables are being brought up. And so that's how, this has lots of things to think about in terms of our wastewater infrastructures, particularly for septic systems. So one thing that we know that climate change does is that climate change decreases the drain field's capacity to remove certain contaminants. So, um, you saw, we saw this picture already, right? When we talk about the separation distance, how much sort of soil that is not filled with water um, is sort of existing beneath the drain, 
drain field infrastructure in the season high groundwater table. If we add sea level rise and or extra precipitation, that seasonal high groundwater table may become elevated. And then you may not have enough separation distance for the soil to do its job and clean that wastewater before the wastewater joins the groundwater. And that starts to put groundwater at risk. So that's something to start worrying about and thinking about proactively. Um, and that's something that my research is focused on. And you know, then you add a storm, and you know, bets are off about what gets washed away and how long those floodwaters take to recede. Another problem with conventional drain fields is that the microbes living in the soil below our drain field infrastructure don't, can't do certain things for us. So a lot, if we get into the science here, into the chemistry nerddom, um, the wastewater that's leaving our septic tank has not seen oxygen yet. Remember I told you there was no oxygen in the septic tank, even though there's air uh, it is not filled with oxygen. And so most of the wastewater leaving the septic tank has nitrogen in the ammonium form, like window cleaner or cat pee. Um, and so the first time that wastewater really sees oxygen tends to be in the drain field. And so this wastewater that's filled with ammonium moves through the soil, maybe finds some oxygen and then turns into nitrate. Nitrate is negatively charged. You see this little minus and soil is negatively charged. So that means as opposite magnets repel each other, nitrate just goes right through the soil, moves very quickly into the groundwater and is moving quickly enough so that a lot of microbes don't get a chance to intercept it and do things with it. And there are also not conditions um, that are favorable for certain processes that help remove nitrogen. So what happens then is that nitrate can make its way into our drinking water or it can make it out into our coastal water bodies and cause things like algal blooms. Okay, and so conventional drain fields do not remove very much nitrogen. They can do a little bit, but not very much. And that's a major concern because wastewater high in nitrogen getting into the environment has human health impacts and environmental health impacts. So from a human perspective, if you have nitrate and nitrite in your drinking water, if you drink drinking water that has even low levels of this chronically, you elevate your current cancer risk. And if the drink, if the levels are high enough and someone uses that water to make formula for an infant, those infants can die and they become um, methylhemoglobic. So they get blue baby syndrome um, where the nitrate is replacing the oxygen in the red blood cells and their bodies aren't mature enough to be able to take care of that the way our adult bodies can. So this is a major problem for, for infants especially. But it's not good for us adults either because eventually after long enough, our bodies can't handle it and we have increased cancer risks. In terms of environmental impacts, if we get a lot of ammonium rich wastewater making its way into the um, waters, that's bad for, for wildlife and aquatic life. But in general, any kind of nitrogen, whether it's an ammonium or nitrate or in a different form, once it makes its way to the coast, it causes eutrophication, um, which results in algal blooms. And then those algae die off and decompose and suck the oxygen out of the water. And then you end up with fish and shellfish kills and all kinds of other issues. So we want to avoid this. And that is where advanced treatment systems come in. Advanced treatment systems are specially engineered systems designed to reduce nitrogen and therefore protect public and environmental health. So one area of priority where we're seeing this is that either of the harbor watersheds on Nantucket, um, the advanced nitrogen removing systems or IA systems are becoming a priority. And the goal there is to remove nitrogen from wastewater in this IA system before it gets to the drain field and can enter the groundwater. And so these IA systems are designed to protect drinking water and surface waters from the groundwater. And also long-term it's protecting our coastal waters because we're making sure that the groundwater is also not related with nitrogen and making its way into our coastal ecosystems. So, how do these magical things do their thing? So advanced treatment systems include some kind of extra specially engineered, oftentimes proprietary whiz bang, therefore sometimes expensive, not just sometimes, components that do nitrogen removal. And so the way this works, so you have right all the waste water from the building going to a septic tank in a conventional system, right? You have primary treatment here, and then it goes out to the drain field, life is good. But with these advanced systems, you have some kind of special whiz-bang technology in between the septic tank and the drain field, and you get secondary treatment there, which sometimes is called advanced treatment. And that can either reduce the waste strength or the amount of organic material in the wastewater, and sometimes it can also reduce nitrogen. It tend, uh, those are not mutually exclusive, but 
it gets a little bit, that, that'll get a little bit into the weeds. But the special extra thing helps us reduce the nitrogen before the wastewater goes to the drain field. So how does this work? Nitrogen is removed in a two-step process, and that process is performed by microbes. Microbes make the magic happen. So the first step is nitrification, where, where you need oxygen. Um, and this normally happens in the drain field, but if we have an advanced system, we can add oxygen to our wastewater. And then after you have nitrification step, you need an anaerobic, no oxygen denitrification step. And what happens is during between nitrification and then denitrification in that order, all of the water soluble forms of nitri nitrogen that are in the wastewater get converted to a gas and the gas can then bubble out of the system into the atmosphere. So you've changed the nitrogen from a water solved form into an oxid uh, to an air uh, a gaseous oh my goodness gaseous form and 80 percent of our atmosphere is nitrogen so that's a great place for it to go so the way this works in sort of an advanced reducing technology is again you have all the wastewater coming into your septic tank for primary treatment we want to keep those solids right and solids also include things like toilet paper uh, food scraps things like that and then you have whatever your magical advanced treatment uh, nitrogen reduction technology. And usually this includes an aerobic and an anaerobic component. So the idea is in whatever aerobic component that has a blower or a fan or some sort of air filled area, you're adding oxygen to the, to the wastewater and you're facilitating nitrification. Then you take that, that nitrified wastewater that's seen the oxygen and you send it to an anaerobic place that often also has carbon and you get denitrification to happen. And the idea is that before that wastewater makes its way to the drain field, the nitrogen has been reduced. And so therefore the drain field has to work less hard to do anything. And so often depending on the technology, sometimes there is some recirculation. So some of the wastewater goes through these steps a couple of times just to get sort of multiple cracks at reducing that nitrogen before you send that wastewater out to the drain field. But this is where sort of the proprietary nature and the different ways to facilitate this kind of come in. And so this is not, it's, this is kind of a generalized schematic so you, have, you understand the process. One thing to keep in mind though, is that these highly engineered advanced nitrogen reducing technologies require some extra bells and whistles. So they require pumps to move the wastewater around. Um, they require blowers and or air vents so that you can get oxygen into that wastewater to get nitrification to happen. You also usually end up then with all of these visible riser lids because you have all these components that are working really hard that at some point a service or a maintenance provider needs to get at to work and assess and sort of maintain and tinker with. You also have a control panel. That's what this box is. This is the brain of the system. This is where your alarms come from. And this is what's telling the pumps to turn on and off and move that wastewater through the system in a way that facilitates nitrogen reduction. And because we have all of these technical pieces, we need a lot more maintenance to make sure the pumps are working, to make sure the control panel is doing what it's supposed to. Um, and so, you know, these systems have a lot of moving parts, which is good because it gives us information proactively, but it also requires, you know, TLC. However, uh, these systems are similar to cars and most people take their cars in for routine maintenance. And so I challenge you to start thinking about your IA systems as a utility or a car that requires maintenance, okay? So uh, if you are sort of in the world of maybe now requiring some sort of advanced treatment technology, and now that you know what it does, you're super gung-ho and you can't wait to get one of these systems, a couple of things to think about as an informed consumer and to ask about when you're, you're considering and working with different professionals that are helping you choose a, a design that's gonna work for your site is making sure when you're thinking about your technology options, there are options. So some things you should be asking and thinking about, you know, is this technology option gonna actually reduce nitrogen? There are advanced systems that just use work on waste strength and there's advanced systems that reduce nitrogen. So if you need nitrogen reduction, make sure you pick a system that reduces nitrogen, right? Um, and then these systems are, you know, are approved by the regulations. So just make sure that the, the system that is on offer meets one of those. Another really important thing to think about is the light, total life cycle cost of the system. And the total life cycle cost includes a couple of different things, such as design and installation, so this is the upfront cost, but these systems with their pumps and their blowers also use electricity. And so 
it's important to kind of consider that. Is it a, a system that uses a lot or a little bit of electricity? What is the maintenance cost? How often does it need to be maintained? What's the frequency? What is done at individual visits? How often do the components need to be replaced? You know, overall cost and sort of all of these together considered are important because some systems may be more expensive or less, less expensive at the beginning, but then have longer sort of long-term costs that sort of keep up. So it's really helpful to ask and understand what to expect. Another question that um, is worth asking is how is the system performing? What kind of data do we have that, that the, what the manufacturer claims that it does, it actually does. And so luckily, Manteca is part of the IA tracking system, part of Barnstable County. And so you can look up some information about that. This is another thing to think about and ask about. Another thing to think about is, are there service providers who are trained to adjust the systems to help tinker with them and maximize their performance? And like, will they come to Nantucket? And another thing that is worth thinking about and knowing is what is the system going to look like during and after installation? What is your, your, your property going to look like? And start thinking about and challenging people to think about, is this system resilient to climate change? What will happen if it gets flooded? Is it susceptible to damage? Um, that is an important question to ask um, as the homeowner. If you are wondering sort of maybe what some of the trade names are out there when I'm ta talking about these advanced systems, um, these are systems that are, are, are common in Southern New England. Uh, Septitech seems to be the winner here on Nantucket based on the IA system that I looked up in Barnesville County, but also Microfast and Advantex products, Marinko, Singular, and Awiko. There's a bunch of different ones, so many others, Rock and Amphidones and Bioclears. There's like a billion other different ones, but these are some of the more common ones. And just to note, right, these advanced systems are considerably more expensive than a conventional system. And they're, you know, twenty to $60,000 plus, depending on how adventurous and tricky your site constraints can be. So it's not a small investment. But here my car analogy comes back, right? You spend, people spend that much and more on cars than they maintain their cars. So there is a natural parallel in my mind to advanced treatment systems. Another question that comes up sometimes is seasonal versus year-round use. Right? If you think about as a seasonal house, right, uh, that system is going to lie dormant and the microbes that are living in that system are going to be starved because there's no fresh, juicy wastewater coming in. So does that matter? So for a conventional system, that does probably matter. Um, in the drain field, in those trenches, there's something that's called the biomat, which builds up and it's just a gloppy mix of jelly goo and microbes and, and different compounds that are in the wastewater and they form um, along the bottom of the trench and help distribute that wastewater. But if you don't add more wastewater, uh, those microbes starve and die off and that biomat breaks down and then that changes how the drain field accepts wastewater. The yeah, good news is that these advanced systems do not appear to be affected by seasonal use based on some research out of the University of Rhode Island. So on the one hand, there are some technologies that specifically go into a survival mode when they detect that they're in, in low use. These systems are smart and, and can figure out what's happening. And um, in a research study looking at about 50 different advanced systems, half of which were used seasonally and half of which were used real, uh, year round in Southern Rhode Island, there was no difference in terms of the total nitrogen coming out of the systems from a concentration perspective. Although overall, over time, the year-round systems do put out more nitrogen into the environment. So that's just something to consider. But the good news is whether or not you use your system four months of the year or all year long, your system is still working. And so that's really, really exciting news. So now we'll switch into the PEPDARC piece. And uh, Emily mentioned a few of these things, but one thing that you can do that's unrelated to septic systems, although I'll get to those, is to make sure you're thinking about your landscaping and keeping that environmentally friendly. So, right, minimize your fertilizer use. Uh, fertilize lightly or not at all. Um, make sure you're not fertilizing right before it rains. Um, if you can, if you are not particular about your glass, grass, consider leaving the grass clippings on the lawn and mulching them back in. So that way you're not removing nutrients that you later need to add with your miracle Grow, you know, Scott's lawn fertilizer. Um, the clad grass clippings have some nutrients in them. Uh, water very lightly, you know, grass doesn't need more than an inch a week or not at all, right? The brown grass that is maybe not the most beautiful for some is actually healthier. And so if you let it go dormant in the summer, it'll be happier in the fall and spring. If you can plant native species of plants and don't plant invasive ornamental species, 
Um, this is good for the wildlife around you, but it's also good in terms of water. They're adapted to this climate and, and can handle this kind of weather. If you ever have any kind of bale, bare soil, uh, make sure it's covered, you know, mulch it or use some sort of ground cover or, or grass or plants. You don't want that soil being washed down into the water bodies and carrying whatever nutrients may be attached to that and then contaminating your water bodies. And the second way that you can protect Nantucket waters is by performing, keeping your septic system performing at its best. So how do you do that? Make sure that you are doing your part to help wastewater treatment. Lots of people abuse wastewater treatment systems, and this goes for on-site systems and centralized systems. How? Mostly, probably you can predict where this is going, but mostly people abuse these systems by flushing things that should not be flushed. So, as my sister famously once said in our childhood, I flushed it and it went away. So like, it was flushable, right? It fit. You know, anything small enough is flushable. So when you do, I'm sure uh, Stephen Visco can talk about this, you can find all kinds of interesting things in septic tanks that clearly were flushed through the pipes, you know, matchbox cars, flashlights, golf balls. So yeah, they're flushable, but if whatever you're flushing isn't disintegrating in the pipes as the turbulence, as it moves through your house's plumbing on its way into the septic tank, it builds up and causes clogs, right? So what you want is the things that get flushed down your, your drains should be breaking up and becoming little bitty nothingness as it goes. These commercials where you can have a wet paper towel that holds 90 pennies, it's so strong. That's exactly what you don't want. Same thing with tissues, right? Tissues are made to hold um, mucus exiting your nose at high speeds and maintain their structural integrity, right? So you don't want that on your hands. So tissues do not break down very well. And so these th kinds of things, tissues and paper towels are common examples of things that do not belong in septic systems because they don't break down easily. Other things that don't belong are basically anything that's not toilet paper or something that left your body, okay? So there's lots of uh, campaigns to show you the horrifying fat bergs and weird things that accumulate in big centralized systems, but these are a problem for onsite systems. So if it's not your, something that left your body and it's not toilet paper, use the garbage can, okay? Because once you flush them, they clog pipes, they can accumulate and, and any, kind of any kind of hard edges inside pipes, accumulate all of this non-breaking down junk and cause clogs. Um, if you're talking about a centralized system, pump and lift stations and intake screens get clogged by all this garbage that people flush. Uh, septic tanks and distribution boxes and drain fields can be destroyed by having lots of non-flushing things and non-biologically breaking down items that get their, find their way into the septic tank. And so what happens is when people do flush these, somebody has to go in there and unclog this and take out the garbage. And that is disgusting. And you're paying someone to do that. So could we maybe find better ways to spend that money? And if you don't have someone unclog it, right, you're going to have some sort of sewage backup, which is also disgusting and a human health hazard. And again, it's expensive and we're paying someone to deal with something which we could prevent by making sure you're putting garbage in the garbage. So even things that are marketed as flushable, usually that's a marketing ploy. Again, if it fits, technically it's flushable. But again, if it's not breaking down, by the turbulence in your pipe so that it's basically disintegrating mush by the time it makes its way into the septic tank, it doesn't belong down your pipes, okay? So flushable wipes, major no-no. Even if it says that they are septic safe or flushable, don't do it. So uh, moving on to other things that you can do to make sure your septic system is behaving aside from not flushing garbage. Um, pay attention to how much water you are using inside your system, inside your home. Don't overload the system. So for example, if you do all of your loads of laundry on one day, that's a lot of gallons of water being generated all at once and that stresses the system. So if you can space out the loads of laundry over multiple days of the week, that will kind of space out the amount of water that's moving through and it won't overwhelm the system. If you notice that anything in your home is leaking, fix it right away because you're adding a lot of extra water to move through your system, which can stir up your septic tank and can keep it from doing the settling it's supposed to. And then you're starting to put the, the things that come after the septic tank at risk because IA systems and drain fields don't do well with solids that have been washed out of the septic system. If you're gonna host a lot of people for more than a few hours, 
uh, consider renting some sort of porta potty type thing so that you're not adding all that extra flow through your system. Um, so that's something you could talk to your service provider about whether or not this might be a good idea, but you can protect your septic system and protect your investment by potentially outsourcing some of your wastewater treatment if you're gonna have a big party or something where lots and lots of people are gonna be there and probably put your system at risk. Remember, keep certain things out of your system. Um, this includes if you do any kind of painting, recreational or inside your home, any of that latex paint, right? Latex paint makes nice coating inside our walls. Guess what? It does the same thing inside your septic system and it does the same thing when it makes its way out to the drain field. So you can destroy your system, your IA technology, by washing your paintbrushes into the sink. So if you need to wash paintbrushes, do it outside on the ground so it doesn't make its way into your system. Any kind of harsh chemicals do not belong in your septic system, right? Your septic system is full of living microorganisms that are making all of that wastewater treatment magic happen. So don't kill them off by dumping a bunch of stuff down there that's going to cause them trouble. If you use a small or we say a moderate amount of bleach, if you're using a cup or two of bleach to clean your house once a week, that is not going to cause a problem. But a lot of heavy duty industrial disinfectants used at scale, like in a home daycare or sort of home nursing facility kind of situation, that is much harder to your system because that's more likely to affect the microbes. But a little bit of household bleach is not going to cause trouble. Any kind of additives that are marketed to help improve your septic system, there's no scientific evidence that those do anything for you. So you might as well save the dollars that you're spending on your special septic system booster and put that towards your next service provider visit. Um, that includes also there are some additives on the market that are to, that advertise never pump your system again. And that is very dangerous because that exactly goes against the point of our septic tank, which is supposed to hold solids back. So if you are mixing them up so that they move away, and you don't have to pump your septic tank out. At some point, you'll have a failed drain field and that's going to be much more expensive. So definitely don't use those. Okay. Another thing that, that you should keep out of your septic system are any kind of excess or expired medications. Again, you don't want those, you don't want to be drinking your neighbor's excess medications, right? So talk to your pharmacists or, or your local communities. There's often drug take back programs so that they can just be, be disposed of properly. And if you have any kind of water softening system for your drinking water supply, make sure that when the system goes through its purge cycle, it creates very, very salty, briny water. You do not want to send that through your septic system. And so check with your local code, but there is ways to plumb that water, which is technically drinking water just with salt into a different kind of system so that you're not adding all this really high salty water to your septic system and stressing the microbes or, or, or um, preventing that settling to happen in the septic tank, okay? Make sure that you have your system inspected and serviced regularly by a qualified service provider, right? This is a utility, it needs TLC so that it can keep working and so you can get a heads up in case it's going to start maybe having trouble. Um, let your service provider know if your household changes, right? If people move home, all of a sudden you're moving your property differently, that might trigger a different sort of regimen and frequency of service visits to make sure things are still working okay. When the service provider is going to tell you and advise you to keep all of your lids, even with the ground surface, um, so that they can get at all of the components easily, this is a really good thing to do. You want to make sure those lids are still child and critter proof though, right? You don't want any accidents. Having lids even with a ground service is especially important even for conventional systems if you don't have an IA system because if you have an effluent filter over at the end of the tank that's moving the wastewater over to the drain field, it's really, really important that that effluent filter is easy to get at because it needs to be cleaned regularly. And it's just keeping the chunks from the liquid from making their way up to the drain field. So if your effluent filter gets clogged, it's doing its job. But it does mean you need to kind of service that every once in a while. So it's super important that you know that you have an effluent filter and that someone else who is serving your system, servicing your system, knows that and takes care of it appropriately. Make sure your service provider is actually visiting multiple times a year unless you have problems and it needs to be more frequently. You know, make sure you're getting a report because it's always better to know kind of ahead of time, just like you do at your free 30 point inspection of the car, like, oh, your brake pads may need to be replaced in the next, you know, whatever. That's good to know ahead of time so you can start budgeting for that. Same thing with your septic system, okay? Find a, a service provider that you like and that you trust. And make sure you don't let your service contact uh, or your maintenance contract lapse, right? You want to have that system maintained and inspected by someone who knows what they're doing. 
you know, if you're, you're part of the IA system, uh, tracking system at Barnes School, you'll get a flag about it. But this is why it's important that you maintain your operation and maintenance contract. Another couple of things, just as we close out, a couple of final thoughts. Thinking about climate change, right? And so think about, are you in a flood zone? Is it possible that flooding could affect your property? And if so, is your system stormproof, right? Are your components either anchored down so that even if floodwaters move across it, they're not going anywhere? Or are your electronics and things above flow height, flood heights so they don't get fried? What is your plan for during or after a storm? Who is gonna come and check your system, make sure it's still working properly and that nothing got washed away or jostled out of position? When's that gonna happen, right? Uh, what are you gonna do in the meantime, especially if you live in that place uh, and you don't know if your system is good or not? Be careful about when your tanks are pumped. Uh, because any kind of empty tank that was recently pumped or uh, an above ground or airfield sort of IA component, if you mix that with flood or high groundwater, that system will act like a cork and it can actually pop out of the ground. So beware if your system is pumped in the off season, you know not, no more water is coming in there. Make sure that at least you, that it gets filled back up with a hose or something so that that tank is not sitting empty in case of a high water event. Another thing to start thinking about, and um, next time if you ever have to upgrade, kind of to have this in the back of your mind, where is your seasonal high groundwater table now? And how is that likely to change in the next 30 years, which like is how long you hope your septic system, right, serves you. And so think about does or find out, does now or will your drain field have enough unsaturated soil to do its job for that duration? And so kind of that's an important thing to think about. And another final thing to think about is your well water, right? Which may or may not be in proximity to your own or your neighbor's septic system. Make sure you get that tested so that you know what you're drinking. And if you have an advanced system, keep track of how it's performing. You know, it could be point of pride and find out if it's misbehaving, find out if there's anything you can do as a homeowner to help um, get it back on track. With that, I will turn things over to Steve so he has um, some things to say, and then I'm happy and looking forward to the questions at the end. Really wonderful information. Um, I know there's a lot there for people to, to think about, and we already have some questions coming in. But now I'd like to introduce our next guest for the evening, Stephen Visco. And Stephen has been on the Board of Health since 2011, when it was first separated from the Select Board. He's been the chair of the Board of Health for the last two years. He's also been in the septic pumping business for quite a long time. His father started their family business in 1964 with the first pump truck on the island. And he's been a licensed, inspect licensed septic inspector and installer since 1995. Uh, he also has been a regular crowd supporter of the Land Council's uh, Water Fund. So thanks, Stephen. Uh, he's going to talk a little bit more specifically about some of Nantucket's regulations and just his experience as um, a pumping operator out here on Nantucket. So welcome, Stephen. Hey, thanks, Emily um, and Melissa. That was a great presentation. Uh, and I'll just touch on a couple things uh, um, as far as maintenance that uh, Alyssa uh, touched on. And I always try to equate it uh, with my clients, like, you know, taking care of your septic is like taking care of your car, you know? So remember the old cars, they didn't tell you actually when you had to change the oil like they do today. So, you know, you have to rely on somebody to say, well, you're going to clean, you know, change your oil every 3,000 miles, and that's seemed to work. So it's the same with your, your septic tank, right? So when, when do you have it done? So here on Nantucket, we have a lot of seasonal houses, and I always tell my clients it's degree of use and time. So I would say most of the tanks on island, probably average, you know, the conventional tanks are probably average now with 1,500 gallon tanks. And those are the minimum size tanks in Massachusetts, whether you have one bedroom or six with the appropriate size leach area. 
So, you know, in a seasonal house, I tell people, you know, once every three or four years, um, if you're seasonal, if you're, you know, there year round with a family, um, four or five people, you should do it at least, at least once every two years. Um, and alluding back to Alyssa's um, display of the tank and the covers, it, it's like she said, it's very important that we show up and, you know, the covers are accessible. And especially, uh, she, she did mention, especially today with the newer systems, the engineers in the last 10 years have been inspecting effluent filters on the outlet of the tank. And that is something that I deal with still every summer with emergency calls on brand new septics that that uh, the whole house is backed up. As soon as I show up and I open up the inlet and I see that the whole thing is over full, I know there's an effluent filter on the end of the tank. So it is, um, I do now with sending out invoices, I have a letter drafted that I do send to clients to let them know that they do have a filter and that that requires maintenance. And some people do it themselves. It's very easy to pull out and you want to pull it out when the level's normal, not when it's over full. And you can just blow it off with your uh, garden hose. You, know, you can actually take it back to the inlet side of the tank and if you want, just spread it off and let it go back on that end. Um, so the covers that are great, that great are very important for us service providers. And it's actually part of the town, you know, it's part of the town code. code. So I will, you know, for clients too, I will actually, you know, I do have an automatic list. I have a lot of people that do, um, are very proactive and have their septic tanks cleaned at least once a year. A lot do every two years. And I will only go back three years because when somebody tells me to put them on automatic and I'm, I'm very good about it, I print a list out every every month and you show, I show up at people's houses to do their tank and then they say they, they didn't ask me to come. So I'll only go back three years for that. Um, so maintenance is very important, um, which Alyssa alluded to. And you know, I'd like to just touch a little bit now on the, the nitrogen reducing systems, the IAs. So the Nantucket Board of Health, along with the Land Council, you know, in the last 25 to 30 years, this, this island's been very proactive in protecting groundwater I mean, we have some of the you know the strictest rules probably around in the commonwealth and these rules were put in place for a reason it wasn't to punish people it was to truly you know protect our groundwater and you know which leads to our estuaries our harbors and all that so starting and you know sponsored also with the land council in 2003 we created nitrogen zones and that first nitrogen zone was a, a zone around Nantucket Harbor. And the letters were sent out back in 03 to have mandatory inspections. And I think there was over 570 letters sent out to have your system inspected. So it did take us a while to get it all done, but uh, people did comply. And did we find many septics that are antiquated? Uh, Yes, yeah, yes, we did. And, uh, you know, most of those systems we found have been, have been fixed. And the, the regulation that um, is in Nantucket Harbor is, is Regulation 64. So 64 constitutes all a zone in Nantucket Harbor. And we did a revision to 64 in September 15th of 2015, all in order to protect groundwater and deem that zone to be an IA zone only, which means you need, if you have a conventional system, the only way you would be able to keep it would be to have an inspection once every five years. What would trigger an upgrade would be a sale of your house, uh, any permit that you pull, 
not that just constitutes ground cover, but even a shed permit um, would trigger an upgrade. And has this regulation worked? It, 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 it's, it's worked and it has, some, it has some bite to it. So what you're seeing is a transition to IAs in a, in a huge area around the ponds. I mean, this, air, this area is big. It stretches all the way from Milestone Road all the way out to the wall when it, um, and it's working. You know, it's gonna take some time probably to see the effects of it. So, but it does have some bite. And starting in 2006, we decided to go to Mattica and create the zone there which started around the landfill, Long Pond, all the way out to Madiket and Eel Point to um, the other side of Massasoit Bridge. Actually, it is some of the systems are in that zone there. So that th those regulations are, are under Madiket and Regulation 51. Again, uh, with the onset of potential sewer coming out we we didn't we had mandatory inspections we got them all done we identified the people that didn't have separation of groundwater those were technical failures they were in limbo for years um, until we decided at the board we were tired of kicking the can down the road sewer wasn't on the horizon so we revised regulation 51 on April 16th of 2020 and created the zone out there to be IA zone only, which is to mirror the Nantucket Harbor uh, zone. So in this past year, if you drive out to Natica, you're going to see a lot of IA tanks out there. We sent 97 letters out to people who had technical failures, asking them to get them fixed. So the septic uh, installation part is is never ending. So it's it's an ongoing thing. We're trying to protect the water out there, and this is one of the things that we could do to do it. So we also in 2010 we created a zone around Hunt Pond, and the only difference now in that zone is. Uh, we didn't, you know, we didn't make it an IA zone only yet. Um, you, you, you still need 10,000 square feet per bedroom, um, but we did not take away the bedroom credits in that zone. So you know, if you have an acre of land and you wanted to get six bedrooms on it and you could put an IA in, in um, the net benefit for the environment, we usually approve those because it's, We'd rather have the IA with six bedrooms than a conventional four bedroom where you're, you know, you're only loading the nutrient loading of a three bedroom septic with an IA. Will that change in the future? We'll, we'll see. Um, the other two zones, Madiket and Nantucket, there, you still, you need 10,000 square feet per bedroom, no matter what. So if you got an acre lot, you can only have four bedroom septic with, and it has to be an IA. Um, I think, uh, you know, Alyssa alluded to a lot of the other things that I was going to mention with the, you know, the basics of septic. So I thought it was more important to throw out those regulations. Uh, it gets kind of confusing. You get a lot of calls now to the board of health. I get a lot of calls to, to try to explain, um, every time I do an inspection now, I send a letter with the with the reports that try, you know, explains the regulations. Um, not everybody's too happy, about it, but uh, they, these regulations they work. Um, it's been a, it's been a little tougher out in Madiket than it was in Nantucket like Harbor. Um, you know, due to the basically the costs of things, and uh, we do have more probably year-round people that uh, live in Madiket than we do around. Around the harbor watershed, the Antarctic harbor watershed. Um, I keep rambling. On, uh, like, uh, you know, if we, we want to do some Q and A's. 
Yeah, I'd be happy, I'm sure, list of all too, to uh, answer any questions that people have. That's great. Thanks, Stephen. Really appreciate your input. And I'm glad that you took a little bit of time to talk about the different zones on island and how the regulations affect property changes and uh, the residents out here. So yes, we do have some questions coming in. I think uh, some of them maybe have been answered, but um, let's see if we can get through a few of them here. So we did have some questions about how often systems should be pumped. And again, speaking specifically about seasonal versus year round. I think you guys did cover that, but maybe you could just mention the time frame one more time. And then the other part of the question is whether for a seasonal home, the system should be uh, pumped at the beginning or the end of the season. And I think Alyssa, you touched on that a little bit when you were talking about not wanting to leave an empty tank throughout the winter for fear of a high groundwater event, but maybe you could just speak a little bit about when the best time of year to actually do the pumping is. I'm not sure who wants to take that. Um, Alyssa can take it. Um, I mean, Stephen is the pumping expert, so I would definitely defer to him. Okay, well, you know, in Madigan especially, and you know, Emily, we, we, you know, that's the, you know, the lower end of the island, which, you know, anytime we have a coastal storm, some of the septic systems, you know, especially along, you know, Tennessee, yeah, on, um, I would not, I would probably not do the, you know, empty somebody's tank in, in, you know, in the fall. So I, I would say, in which I do, I, I'm very busy in the, in the spring. Uh, people are coming back, um, they're calling. So I, we do probably more regular septic pumping uh, in the springtime prior to people showing up than we do in the, in the fall. So, um, I would definitely do, you know, do springtime. We do have some lowlands around there, and um, actually on the other side of Millie's Bridge, we we created a that to be a tight tank zone only, I believe, in 2017. So anybody that has a septic system over there now and um, it's conventional and they and they, and they have a failure, they'd have to put a tight tank in. Um, we didn't want to have uh, such a small area there, close to close to Matica Harbor, with uh, in, a, in a very in a shallow groundwater table, as you know. To uh, we wanted to reduce nutrient loading, so we do have a lot of tight tanks over there. I take care of um, some systems. We put in seventeen that were actually IAs um, prior to to that reg change. Um, but any, you know, any new construction that actually happens over there, you have to have a tight tank. Most of those tight tanks too, they're, you know, they're all engineered H, H20. If they, if they had to be in the water table, they're designed to display so much water, even when they're empty. So um, I'm, I, we haven't had any issues so far, but that doesn't mean that, that we can't in the future. Mm -hmm. Definitely probably something to keep thinking about for, for as conditions change in the future. So there was one question that came in that I think I can probably answer, just asking a little bit more about the breakdown from the breakdown of how much nitrogen is actually entering the groundwater or our water bodies, I think, from wastewater like septic systems versus other sources like fertilizer. And I think that's really going to depend on what watershed you're talking about and what the water body itself is. Um, if you're looking at inputs to, say, Nantucket Harbor, I remember when the um, Massachusetts Estuary Report was done for Nantucket Harbor, I think they had shown that about 70% of nitrogen is actually atmospheric that enters the water body through the water surface. But as far as it's coming into the surrounding watershed, I'm pretty sure that in Nantucket Harbor, it's a pretty close to even split between wastewater and fertilizer and previous surfaces. 
But again, it's really going to depend on where you are. You'll have much more of the impervious surfaces and maybe fertilizer inputs closer to the town and in different areas. Uh, but that's what I remember the approximate breakdown to be. I don't know, Alyssa, if in Rhode Island, you've probably experienced anything different, but I think it just depends a lot on the system. Um, so there was um, another actually specific question about Epsom salt bath, which I haven't actually heard that question before and whether there's any concern about using Epsom salt in the bath. I would say this falls under the moderate category, right? Like an Epsom salt bath once a week is probably not going to be a huge problem. And we're talking about a 1500 gallon tank, right? Even if it's a hundred gallons of a huge tub full, you're probably fine. If you're having monster bath parties every single day and every member of your family is going through five pounds of Epsom salt, then maybe we start talking and worrying. Great. Um, okay, and then here's a, a question for you, Stephen. Uh, and this this might be a little bit of a loaded one, and we are getting a little short on time, but I'd love to have you address it. Um, is the requirement for IA systems out in Madikit going to help keep town sewer out of Madikit? Well, one thing that we, you know, if town sewer does come to that, one thing we did do for anybody who's installing in IA, and we did that this year, we changed, it used to be a 10 year exemption if sewer came by your house. And you know, Board, of Health, Board of Health in charge of Regulation 69, which means if sewer comes in front of your house, it's an automatic hookup. So, it used to be 10 years, we, we added another five, and the five is from when, so you get 15 years, and it's from the time the certificate of compliance is issued. So usually the certificate of compliance are issued or at the end. Previously, we were going by the permit date. So there's a two year period there. Permits are good for two years. So usually the septic is one of the last things on any job or anything to get to get installed. So now we decided to go by the certificate of occupancy. So you have a 15 year exemption from the time you put the system in. Mm -hmm. The you know the town sewer, that's a you know that's a debate and, and, and something that I'm sure we're gonna have meetings about in the future. And I I think it's you know it's in the forefront. So that's gonna be a whole nother webinar. Yes, that's definitely going to be an ongoing conversation, but it's, I think, interesting for people to hear how you guys considered that and addressed it to some extent in that, in that regulation. Okay, so I think we'll do one more um, question, and it's an interesting one. There's uh, someone who's asking, what can you do or how can, how can you uh, talk to your neighbors if they don't seem to be complying? If you're pretty sure that your neighbors have not been servicing their septics in quite some time. Do you guys have any experience working with, with people that have run into that? Well, I sure. And I would tell people, don't be afraid to call the Board of Health. And years, years ago when you you know wanted to make a complaint you had to put it in writing and send it in that's not the case now you just have to call you don't have to give your name if you think something's wrong with your neighbor's septic and believe me you'll you'll know and uh, if you think they're in non-compliance don't be afraid to call we, our agents would drive by there check it out so you know you know on the others side of being a friendly neighbor, you know, some, you know, lots of neighbors see that you just had the pump guy come. So then it's, then it sticks in their head. Geez, when, when's the last time, you know, I had my tank. So, you know, a lot of times when you don't see the covers in the yard, it's out of sight, out of mind until something happens. Like when you're taking a shot out and things don't drink. So I deal with, I deal with that a lot. So. Mm -hmm. You know, if you haven't had your tank pumped out in the last five years, you, you probably do. Well, I think it's really helpful just for people to know that they can actually pick up the phone and call the Board of Health. There's a place for them to contact um, 
to talk about that if they have a concern. Well, thank you both so much uh, for the information and for joining us. I personally think that septics are such an important topic and I, I hope that we'll be able to do another webinar like this on septics again in the future, but thank you both so much. And thanks to everyone for joining us this evening. Um, we look forward to having you at our the rest of our clean water series this summer. Our next presentation in June is actually going to be on some sandbar shark research that the Land Council is sponsoring. And I also want to give a special shout out and say thank you to our Water Fund Founder Circle members, of which Stephen Disco is one, because the Water Fund is uh, what's sponsoring this program for us this year. So thanks again, everyone. Wish you well, and we'll see you next month.